Hi everyone, I'm Don Rooney. And I'm John Timpain. Welcome to the Musical Inner Tube, the podcast born out of a mistake. We once meant to introduce a soothing musical interlude, but we said soothing musical inner tube and the name stuck. On this podcast, we talk to interesting people about their interesting lives, jobs, hobbies, and passions. Difference makers who really make a difference. On today's Musical Inner Tube, we welcome back political commentator Dick Pullman. Dick is Maury Povich writer in residence and professor of journalism at the University of Pennsylvania, where he's been since 2006. He's also a former national political writer and political columnist for the Philadelphia Inquirer, where he and I were both colleagues at one time. Follow his work at dickpullman.net. Welcome back, Richard. It's good to see you. It's a pleasure to see you guys again. Anything to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> That's the question, isn't it? Uh, I was writing a letter to somebody, and in the time where it took me to go from page one to page three, everything changed, and I had to rip it up and start again. So we're sitting here. We have a new Democratic nominee. For president, maybe, as we sit here, she has not been ratified officially, but it does seem as though Kamala Harris has commandeered the following so that the convention won't be a problem. Where do you see this going? What do you think is interesting right now? There might be a few things you could say. <laughs> yeah, well, there are. I mean, you know, the speed of, uh, uh, of events this past week um every other i mean ever it reminds me of there's a old a, a lyric a bob dylan lyric i forget which song it was um oh yeah it's a song called things have changed and he won the oscar for it uh for a movie and he uh there's one line in there where he says the next 60 seconds can seem like an eternity <laughs> and and that's what it felt like and just <laughs> i'd go on a bike ride and i'd come back this past week and the and the world had changed again um, so everybody is try. Everybody seems to be um, uh, madly trying to readjust to it. I think the best readjustment of all has come from uh, Kamala Harris and her people, uh, who have just like orchestrated, uh, really w- the most amazing, uh, efficient rollout uh, of a new candidate um, that I've ever seen. And I've been, you know, covering politics on and off, been mostly on since uh, uh, 1988. Um, the fact that obviously there was a lot of work going on behind the scenes uh, as Joe was in his Joe Biden was in his final throes uh, where they just wanted to be ready and hit the ground running uh, in terms of what they wanted to say and who they were going to contact within the party and getting social media stuff up and going um, and um, tapping into uh, donors. And so, you know, I mean, the, the reports we have, and I think we have yet to see in the press, the definitive story on this is uh, that she's working the phones. She and her colleagues or or allies, I should say, are work, working the phones really, really hard uh, to um, uh, get up support and basically to clear the field. Um, and the fact that nobody else, none of these other potential candidates who are now actually potential vice presidential candidates, um, wanted to uh, 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 prolong the, De- the Democrats' intramural agonies of the last month. There was almost this feeling like, you know, let's just put all this behind us and and, and get to work and not have a new period of chaos. Uh, so um, I think all of this has really put uh, uh, Trump uh, back on his heels. Uh, they weren't expecting this or they, were, they could have, uh, but I think they had wish casting there. Um, and they were all geared up to run against the old guy. And now all of a sudden, uh, their candidate is the oldest, uh, oldest candidate in American history, uh, who can't string sentences together. And so, you know, the, the, the script has been completely flipped. I mean, pick, pick your metaphor. The chessboard has been reset. Um, so I think what we've seen in the last few days, uh, amidst, uh, her, um, um, almost, uh, completely erasing Trump's lead in in the various polls. Uh, She's already making gains. This was supposed to be the week where he was supposed to get the so-called bounce off his convention. He got nothing. 
She hasn't even had hers yet. Uh, it's in a few weeks. Uh, she hasn't even picked the vice president, uh, pr- vice presidential candidate yet from a, uh, a, a bounty, uh, a basket of riches, really. Um, so I think the, the Trump people have really been trying to figure out exactly how they want to go at her. Various Republicans have made misogynistic and uh, uh, racist remarks, as as we would expect. And uh, some of the Republican leaders in the House like, put out something where they said, don't do that. Uh, but uh, right. they, they can't help themselves. So I think they're going to try to do the um, uh, something from the Republican playbook that has worked occasionally. Uh, it didn't work against Obama, but it's worked against others in the past. Basically, to paint her as too far left for uh, the mainstream. Um, you know, she's a California liberal, uh, this kind of stuff. Um, so, she, and she can mitigate that a lot, I think, by who she picks as vice president. But um, I'm sure you guys have questions about that in particular. So I should pause for breath. <laughs> Let me uh, throw something in here. I've seen an ad that the Republicans have put on television so far, which I thought was pretty weak, but it's the first attack ad against Harris. And they say that uh, Kamala was in on it. She knew about uh, the president's weaknesses and mental problems and covered it up. And then they go on to make the usual problem uh, problematic statements about how everything that Biden did was terrible and he was the worst president ever and all that sort of thing. But I thought that was an interesting tack to take, especially right up front in the ad, to kind of blame her for Biden's mental incompetence. Well, I don't know if, if your Don, if your question is, do I think that would be effective with uh, voters? Do, do, do you think that will be effective with voters? <laughs> uh, answer: I'm skeptical. Um, the reason is, is the reason is well, two things. I mean, first of all, you know, what was the vice president, any vice president, uh, supposed to do in a situation like that? You know, they're not going to get a, out ahead of 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 the uh, person that they report to you know, and say, hey, it's time to get out, or, hey, I'm going to tell the press what's going on here. You know, no vice president's going to do anything like that. But more importantly, I think it's backward looking. Um, you know, the, the Trump people still want to, they still want to run against Biden. They still want to run against him being old. And, and you know, that's their safe ground. But it's backward looking to do that. I think most people are just saying, well, you know, the 70% of Americans or something like that who want who thought he was too old and that he shouldn't run. Now he's not running. So they've turned the page. And um, I don't think they care about trying to relitigate what happened in the last six months. So uh, what she would say to something like that, if it came up, say, in a debate, if Trump does debate her, uh, I don't know what she would say. But probably it would be something like, well, you know, we're, t- we're here to talk about the future. We're here to talk about not what, what happened, but what happens next and then go into her, you know, um, her uh, her agenda. I was very surprised by what you mentioned that after a burst of, well, you have to say it, sort of misogynist and racist sort of quips, some of which got to be, well, more than on the edge of obscene, they went over the brink, but that a lot of folks in the Republican hierarchy said, no, re- reel that sucker back in. You don't get to do that. That was really stunning how quickly that happened and how quickly people pivoted and they're looking for something else. So we've gone from racist to floundering. But the fact was that uh, there was a call that went out so quickly to correct or not to do that. Aren't you surprised by that? That seems something that was something we hadn't seen before. Yeah, yeah, it, it did in the sense that um, it, um uh, that kind of dog, those kinds of dog whistles have been very common in the past, um, but they must have some kind of internal soundings uh, that it's going to uh, turn off people um, this time around. And, you know, uh, Obama went through a lot of the racist stuff. Uh, he won big, he won re-election. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there's some feeling within the re- Republican uh, hierarchy there that uh, this stuff isn't going to, isn't going to work again. They know they have to pull independent voters, uh, however small but important that particular cohort is. And I don't think they think it's going to fly with them. Um, uh, you know, when we hear uh, one of the one of the biggest um, 
dog whistles, of course, it's, it's, you can't even call it a dog whistle. It's a shriek that everybody hears, uh, was this whole thing that she was a, uh, a DEI uh, yeah. hire. Um, yeah. and, you know, which basically is kind of like saying, you know, anytime, uh, anytime a woman of color, uh, rises, uh, it has to be because the fix was in and they're not as qualified as white people. Um, and, uh, uh, Lisa Murkowski, the, uh, Republican, uh, Senator from, uh, Alaska who votes independent a lot, you know, even said something about that. You know, she questioned the, this, that, that, that attack. Um, so it'll be interesting to see whether it does come up again. One of the, uh, attacks that Trump has already pulled on her, I guess he wrote it on his, uh, true social thing was that she's dumb as a rock. Um, and that's kind of like, Oh, that's right. That's, that's a quote. Yeah. And that, that's kind of like the calling, calling the kettle black or something. You know, I mean, that's just a windmills cause cancer. Uh, you know, I mean, there, there's the, how many, you know, you can rake the forests after, after a climate change fire. I mean, there, it's endless, right? So, and, and dumb as a rock is another, you know, that's again, you know, uh, uh, they're not as intelligent as white people. Um, uh, Kellyanne Conway tried something on Fox News the other night where she said, uh, uh, she's, uh, you know, she's lazy. She doesn't work hard. You know, that's, that's another one you can easily uh, connect the dots on. Um, the other one that, uh, um, Trump tried the other day invoking Obama, uh, when he, uh, posted something where he's been trying to, uh, weasel out of a uh, September debate with Harris. That's kind of where it stands now. And the statement he put out was, well, you know, she will wait. She hasn't been nominated yet. And she hasn't gotten an endorsement from Barack Hussein Obama, quote unquote, who, who thinks he, he says, who thinks that she's a Marxist fraud. And (laughs) he just put that out yesterday, hours before Obama has now endorsed, um, uh, Harris. So, uh, you know, so, they don't. They don't quite know what to do. I think if I was advising them, which of course I would never be, but if I was, I'd probably say try to tie her to uh, what uh, your internal polls say are the least popular aspects of the uh, of the Biden uh, program, which is or the Biden record, uh, which would I guess would include uh, you know border crossings and uh, stuff like which some of them have. They've been trying that with her, and my guess would be that if he does debate her, uh, that would come up sure. for sure. sure. The borders are thing, uh, maybe deficit spending, uh, but the, these kinds of things uh, in love with Red Dink. Yeah. So as you know, Richard, in 2020, uh, Kamala Harris was not a success as a candidate. She just did not make much of an uh, impression. She didn't rise really high to the top. Uh, she didn't connect. Uh, she didn't seem all that adroit in, well, political candidate skills. Uh, I'm just wondering what happened. <laughs> she seems a lot better. Well, I, I, I know watching the first few rallies um, that she's had and some of the ways she's handled press questions off the cuff. Uh, I think the diff- one, of the, I think one of the problems that she had in, in, a, in that aborted campaign, which where she dropped out even before the Iowa caucus. Um, was that, uh, you know, she couldn't quite figure out what her organizing theme, uh, for the, uh, for the candidacy should be. She wanted, I think, lean on being a former prosecutor. Uh, but at the time, you know, the atmosphere in and around the, the Democratic base was, you know, kind of hostile to, uh, police, uh, you know, and there were people on the left who were talking about defunding the police, stuff that went nowhere. But, um, you know, she, she may have had felt like she had the wrong profile for that year. So she was kind of flailing and there was a lot of problems with her internal staffing and stuff like that. I think the difference now is she's got the wind at her back. Um, she's got, uh, she has Trump's record. Uh, she has, uh, his, um, uh, his indictments and his conviction in New York and his, uh, civil, uh, court convictions in New York. Um, and, uh, and so there's, there's a playbook that she can already run with. Uh, she's got the Biden record, uh, a lot of which, uh, Biden, uh, tragically was not able to sell, uh, for whatever reason, including, uh, 
by all you know by all measures uh, you know the most robust post pandemic economy in the Western world. We can start with that. The infrastructure law. Uh, Inflation Reduction Act, saving union pensions. I mean, it goes, uh, you know, uh, uh, chip manufacturing coming back to the U.S. That's stuff that she can draw on. She's got a record already uh, that she can um, um, campaign on. You know, it's like the narrative is already there for her, whereas the last time she had to start from scratch and couldn't quite figure it out in a vacuum. So, um, and judging from what we've seen, uh, what we're, what I was talking about at the top about getting ready behind the scenes, just in case, uh, Biden did uh, step down. Um, you know, she's, she has put it together. She has marketed it. And, uh, the kinds of, uh, the lines that she is, um, uh, trying out, uh, call and response with the crowd. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, politics for people who don't pay attention every day the way we do. Most people don't. Um, and if you have this, we're not going back mantra and it sticks uh, and that she's good and charismatic on the stump because uh, politics is highly visual. Um, and if she can just do that every day between now and November, uh, you know, she's got a she's got a darn good chance. And I would never have thought that uh, uh, there was any chance uh, to uh, keep Trump out of the White House. Uh, a week and a half ago. Um, so uh, I'm just adjusting as just like everybody else. I uh, was supposed that with, with the enthusiasm that's behind her now, she has gathered in Democrats who were worried about voting for Biden, mostly because of his age. But I'm now wondering if she will appeal to those fence voters who the, the undecideds who kind of like we're starting to look at the election as the lesser of two evils. You know, which old guy am I going to vote for? And they weren't really sure that either one was better than the other. But now with Harris in there, that changes the canvas a little bit. Do you think it changes it enough for undecided voters to maybe think about coming on board? Well, yeah. I mean, I think this is her opportunity, her golden opportunity right now. And it's crucial. I wrote something about this the other day. It's crucial. The next month is crucial because she's going to be basically, hopefully, uh, defining herself on her own terms for the next few weeks. Because, you know, for a lot of people, uh, you know, anybody who's vice president, they don't pay a lot of attention to that person. They don't really know what that person's doing. Um, You know, it's obviously a much more, uh, you know, active, robust job than it was uh, back 100 years ago when John Nance Gardner said, and I'll clean this up, uh, for consumption here, where he said that uh, the job was, was, wasn't worth a, a bucket of warm spit. <laughs> um, you know, it, it matters now. But most people don't really know what the vice president's doing or who or what the person's like or, or anything. So, you know, she is like in, uh, for a lot of these, for a lot of swing votes that are independent, it's kind of independence, it's kind of like introductory mode. And one of, there's a new ad, there's a new, uh, um, Harris ad that I just saw went up online last night, where it's basically like a biography ad. The first half of it, it's a biography ad. She's talking about being a prosecutor, uh, the kind of people, you know, she she did some stuff against the banks. Uh, you know, there's a whole list of it. Uh, fairly kind of like little guy versus the big guy stuff. Um, and, uh, and then being a, a senator and, you know, questioning a lot of the Trump administration officials like Bill Barr. Um, and, uh, and then she segues into her second half of the ad segues into what, what the aspirational program would be for the next four years, defending various freedoms that are under attack, which is smart, having Democrats trying to recapture the word freedom from conservatives and say there is, you know, freedom for reproductive freedom, you know, freedom to vote, freedom. I mean, so, um, uh, so she recognizes that that is the biggest challenge, and she wants to do that. She's really – it's pedal to the metal right now, smartly, because she doesn't want to give uh, the uh, the Trump forces uh, any openings to define her negatively. Now, they're going to – they'll they'll try, and it'll work with some people. You know, this we, there's still three months to go. You know, in, in French election or British election terms, that's that's forever. Uh, but for us, it's not. 
Um, so, you know, so there's going to be periods where I, I'm sure people uh, in the Democratic coalition are going to be biting their nails. Um, but, um, you know, but I'm I'm more than cautiously optimistic and I'm I'm actually watching the um, as I'm sure you guys are uh, how she just what she decides to do with the vice presidential nomination. We'll return to our podcast in just a moment. But first, here's a soothing musical interlude. Dick Pullman is Mari Povich's writer-in-residence and professor of journalism at the University of Pennsylvania, where he's been since 2006. From 1992 to 2006, he was national political writer for the Philadelphia Inquirer, covering presidential elections from 1992 to 2008. He was also political columnist at the Inquirer, and from 2012 to 2019, he was a columnist on WHYYFF. Follow his work at dickpullman.net. That's D-I-C-K-P-O-L-M-A-N.net. And check out his University of Pennsylvania webpage at english.upenn, that's U-P-E-N-N dot E-D-U, slash people, slash Dick hyphen Pullman. And now we return you to the musical inner tube already in progress. Speaking of vice presidents, another figure on the national stage who wasn't there a couple of weeks ago to the same degree is J.D. Vance, uh, known mostly uh, in these parts as an author, uh, but also a senator. And very strange choice in some ways. And I'm just wondering what your analysis of J.D. Vance's performance so far has been. I might add that for many vice presidential candidates, the vice, pres- the vice president's role has been as an attack dog, which is sort of hard to be more of an attack dog than the main candidate for the Republicans, uh, Donald Trump. I mean, you can't. <laughs> that guy's already attacking. But J.D. Vance has done a lot of attacking, not to the best um, results, I don't think. Uh, but I'm wondering what you think. Yeah, well, you know, I, there's there's reports out now that um, uh, Trump's sons were arguing vociferously for Vance when Trump was actually leaning in other directions. Um, so I've just that's just been in the last few hours, um, and I, I think he was. I think they felt. Uh, confident to overconfident that this thing was basically in the bag, that Joe was going to be stay in the race and be easy to beat. And so, you know, Vance kind of, uh, sort of like, uh, you know, he's kind of like Trump's mini me, you know, he, he kind of like doubles, <laughs> triples down on all the stuff that Trump is already able to do with the base. And, you know, and he, 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 you know, and, and he's got a string of misogynistic comments, one of which I'm going to get into here, um, that um, don't exactly uh, advertise him as someone who can uh, broaden uh, the potential uh, electoral possibilities uh, for Trump, you know, in terms of attracting new voters. Um, and uh, he doesn't have much uh, charisma, from what I can tell, in terms of politics being visual. Um but the biggest problem I have, and I'm, if I may, I want to quote, if I may, from the piece I wrote uh, earlier this morning, the column that, that I posted earlier this morning. And this was my opening paragraph because it segues perfectly. Serious questions. Does, did anyone in Trump's inner circle bother to vet J.D. Vance in advance? Did anyone perform even minimal due diligence looking for old bombshells that might explode in Trump's face? Or did everyone at MAGA headquarters actually believe it would be a great idea to hire a guy who's a veritable parody of a misogynistic meathead? And so um, I go on to try to, of course, you know, as I tell my students, you want to use a phrase like that, you got to back it up. Okay. So what's happened in the the, the last few days is that, and it wasn't so hard to unearth, somebody pushed a few buttons on the internet and found them, these comments he made. Uh, where he's basically assailing people who uh, don't have children. And he had these comments from 2021 about, uh, you know, we have too many child, quote unquote, childless cat ladies. Uh, and um, uh, it's and it's, it's not a good idea, I don't think, to malign. I did, I went through the census on this, U.S. census, 
It's not good to malign 21.6% of the adult population. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that I don't know if, you know, that's not, I don't think that's anything Trump is necessarily I'd bargain for. So he made these comments. It wasn't just about childless cat ladies. He said, uh, this is in 2021, I'm quoting here. When you go to the polls in this country as a parent, you should have more power. You should have more of, of an ability to speak your voice than people who don't have kids. Let's face the reality. If you don't have as much of an investment in the future of this country, maybe you shouldn't get nearly the same voice. And there's another, somebody, ABC News this morning has unearthed something he said in 2021 where he said that people without kids should be taxed more higher than people with kids. So, um, you know, uh, it's kind of like none of his business, whether if somebody chooses not to have children in their lives, that's their business. Or there's also, of course, millions of people who want to have kids who can't, you know, and uh, they're trying to lean on IVF, uh, in vitro fertilization, which, by the way, he voted against in a Senate vote earlier this year in terms of protecting it. But so um, this is really uh, this has gone on for five days. He went on a uh, – Megan Kelly has some kind of a – I don't know if it's a podcast or whatever. She had a show this morning. He went on the show to defend himself, and he said, oh, it was just a sarcastic remark, which is, of course, you know, sort of a distant cousin of Trump's. I was only kidding. It was nobody has a sense of humor when he gets caught out. So this is what she says. This is a sarcastic comment. Uh, but he has said it like – he said it like three or four different conservative forums. Yes. Um, and it's gone on for all, for a week. And what I'm struck by is that Trump hasn't said a single word publicly in um, Vance's defense on this, uh, because uh, I did the I guy did the math. Twenty one point six percent of the adult population it doesn't have kids. That's fifty million Americans. Um, and so this <laughs> this is not what you want from a vice. You don't want a vice president who's going to undercut and make worse the problems you've already have which is that MAGA world feels like it's an exclusive club just for, you know, a certain type of, you know, white male and white female and hardly anybody else. Um, oh, and of course, the biggest thing of all, who's who's the number one childless cat lady in America? Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, who at some point is going to endorse Harris. So uh, all these people are putting out uh, you know, uh, video, uh, not videos, they're putting out memes of uh, Taylor Swift, who was on the cover of Time magazine with a cat wrapped around her neck. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, um, you know, it's not not a good idea to tick off Taylor Swift, who has more Instagram followers worldwide than there are Americans. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So that's my take on J.D. Vance. I, I remember uh Seeing that a couple of days ago, I guess it was uh, the the cat lady remark was when um, Tucker Carlson was still on the air because it was on his show, uh, probably on Fox. But anyway, uh, it was when J.D. Vance was running for the Senate in Ohio. And an explainer line that he put out there was that people who run for office and don't have kids don't have a stake in the future. So they're they're not thinking about what they're going to leave kids, what sort of world they're going to leave the kids later because they don't have kids to worry about, which I thought was a little empty-headed. The second thing that occurs to me is that Donald Trump didn't give two whits about Mike Pence either. He seems to run independent of yeah. his vice presidential yeah. candidate. Yeah. Um, all good points. I mean, people who don't have kids – um, millions and millions of them have nephews and nieces and, and stepchildren like Kamala Harris. Um, so, you know, uh, the, and, and they, and they support candidates who want to, uh, increase, uh, child care, which is part of the democratic platform. Uh, and they support candidates who want to, uh, you know, uh, uh broaden, uh, avail- uh, the eligibility for Obamacare. Uh, which, you know, uh, helps people, you know, uh, through the Medicaid program who are in poverty with kids. And so, you know, this, this notion that this, this, that, that whole line of, uh, of, of argument of his 
is, you know, is it's, I don't know whether to call it just weird or reactionary, but I can call it something else. And this is something that's very interesting. I didn't know about until uh, yesterday was that he, uh, he got this idea uh, or he's sharing an idea from Victor Orban, the Hungarian autocratic dictator. Uh, because that, of course, Orban's party uh, tried to enact, uh, this was a few years ago, it hasn't gone anywhere yet, but they tried to enact something where they were going to tax people without children at, at a higher rate. So, uh, you know, and this is, of course, Tucker Carlson loves Orban. Orban was just at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, you know, it, it, it does, it's not hard to connect the dots here. Um, and so going back to the question about, you know, Kamala having, uh, being more effective as a communicator, she has so much, she has so much to work with here. Um, and even some of the terminology she's using, uh, and some of her people are using saying not just making the case against Trump, prosecuting the case against Trump, which has a great double meaning given, you know, his, his still, his legal woes and the fact that he's still f- uh, facing a sentencing, a potential sentencing, uh, for his uh, criminal guilty ver- verdict uh, during September. September the 18th, I just heard. Correct. And, yeah. uh, that's, uh, if they get there, uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, so Richard, I've asked you this question before. It's sort of a philosophical question, but, it comes up even more sharply now. The rate of change on the political scene, things we've never seen before coming up in incredible succession very quickly. Does this have anything, is this going to be one of the things that that people have to worry about? The the voters are not famous in the United States of America for having long memories. Uh, They're they're not famous in in being deep, uh, analysts, and they're not required to be any of those things. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, as 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 a large number of people, they look around and say, "Well, who's president today?" It's a it's a day after Labor Day, you know. <laughs> they still most of us uh, don't start paying attention until later. But it's going to be a very different race, especially after the DNC. I'm wondering how people stay abreast of this. What do you think? Well. Um- uh, something you just first of all, something you just said uh, a few minutes ago about people have short memories. I think it was Gore Vidal who said the USA stands for the United States of Amnesia. <laughs> yeah. and, and and I really I I really believe that. I mean, sometimes the conversations I have with intelligent friends about things that just happened a few years ago, you know, and they they forgot it or they didn't, you know, or they have a mis mis memory of it. Um, but anyway, so that aside, um, uh, you know, we have to sort of, I think everything is going to be, um, uh, Harris has to basically campaign, uh, as if she is, um, telling people, um, uh, things for the fir- very first time, like they're hearing it for the very first time. Um, because for some reason they weren't crediting, crediting, um, um, Biden, uh, for the economy at all. Uh, they weren't crediting him for rebuilding the, the, the roads and bridges, which they're driving on every single day. Um, and so, you know, she has to sort of, you know, and, uh, with a, with a full court press in every aspect of media, um, she has to, um, um, drive that home. And, one of the things I think that's different, you were talking about maybe the velocity of change. So I want to at least sure, that's bring this whole, into my answer. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things that I'm, I'm really struck by in the last week, and I foresee this continuing for the next few months, is just the the flood of um, uh, what it's called um, user-generated content, which is all these young people under the age of 30 putting up stuff on TikTok, uh, about Harris, you know, they're putting together videos and music and I don't know, things beyond my particular expertise. Um, and you know, that's how a lot of people, particularly young people who were, you know, couldn't have cared less about Joe. And I saw it in my students in Penn. Um, they're tuning in, you know, uh, because Harris kind of speaks to them. It's her vibe. It's her profile. It's all that kind of stuff. You know, they're teed up for her now, and they get a lot of their information 
uh, from uh, information as such uh, from social media and TikTok in particular. Um, and then so uh, it's, uh, you know, we can say, oh, God, that's really superficial. Uh, but if it if it turns out their votes, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take it. Um, you know, the, the first week of her candidacy reminds me of um, a little bit of uh, when Obama ran in 2008 and he became, for whatever the social media um, uh, cutting edge was at that time, 15, 16 years ago, uh, he was, he was all over it. And, uh, and, and I see a lot of that same kind of energy happening now. So, um, so I think it's a combination, um, you know, of all these different factors that, you know, one of the good things is that, yeah, people were exhausted. They were exhausted by the status quo. Nothing seemed to be moving. Nothing seemed to be changing, uh, when it was Biden, Trump, um, and now the dynamic has been completely upended and there's an end date only three months away. So I think with all that uh, going on, I think that's enough to make people, I don't want to say everybody, uh, to make an enormous percentage of the electorate actually focus in. And as we all know, Kamala's brat. Yeah, um, I, I knew what that meant last night. Uh <laughs> I have since forgotten it. That was twelve hours ago. But again, that's no that that's that comes from a very popular, you know, that comes from a very popular um a black performing artist who put it out there and uh, all the people, all the zillions of people who follow her saw that. And, you know, if it teased them up to listen to uh Harris's message, uh, then all to the good. Um Having said all that, I think the other thing about the vice presidential pick is, uh, and not everybody may necessarily agree with me on this, including you guys, but, you know, my, no, I said before that, uh, the, that the Republicans are going to try to paint her as, you know, too liberal, San Francisco liberal, California liberal, that old, that old stereotype. Um, and I think she needs, uh, I think she needs a, uh, a very, and there are a number of them, a very capable white guy. Uh, who can go into uh, the Rust Belt states uh, and, uh, you know, and just really talk Turkey with uh, white working class voters, which which Biden was actually made some really made some headway on in 2020 vis-a-vis Hillary in 2016. And we don't want to necessarily lose lose that. So and I think so. I think a lot of these guys names who are in contention right now um, are I think are very, very capable of doing that. Um, particularly personally, and this could be completely off base when the, when the announcement gets made before August 7th, uh, personally, I think, uh, Mark Kelly, the Senator in Arizona, uh, who is, uh, you know, Navy combat vet, astronaut, former astronaut, um, elected twice, elected as a Democrat twice in a border state where he's had to deal with the immigration issue. Um, and, uh, there was one other aspect of him that I that I like, and now I'm like, a, now I'm for, oh yes, he's married to Gabby Giffords, who survived um, uh, that the horrific shooting, um, and you know it personifies the gun reform issue, which Harris is really uh, vocal about, uh, and she can speak to it personally, along with Mark Kelly uh, out on uh, out on the stump and and traveling around, so. Um, uh, I mean, if it's not him, if it's one of the others they're talking about, including our very own Josh Shapiro, you know, fine. Uh, but I, I think for some, I think Kelly maybe adds the most to the ticket. But that's just me. Well, Richard, we always learn so much for you when you come on. And I think we're going to be talking to you again in a couple of weeks, maybe in a month and a half to see where we are. Because who knows, after the DNC might be a different world yet again who knows who knows thanks for being our guest let's again. Let, let's stay in touch uh september if there's a debate in particular it'd be that'd be a good time but uh you know who the heck knows you know events are in the saddle and ride mankind emerson <laughs> reputedly said <laughs> so there we go and i i would only add dick that i think you're probably brat <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll check it with my kids. I'll check it with my grandkids and see if they agree. DickPullman.net, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. He understands the assignment. We'll talk to you soon, Rich. All right. Thank you, guys. And thank you for listening to the Musical Inner Two. Hey, let us know how we're doing. 
Send us an email at musicalinnertube, all one word, at gmail.com. Do you know someone with a great story to tell? Let us know. Send us an email or log in to our website, musicalinnertube.com, and click on the microphone in the lower right-hand corner to leave us a voicemail. And while you're on our website, take a few minutes to listen to past episodes of the podcast. They're all there, along with pictures and biographies of our guests, blog posts, and lots more. And as always, our thanks to Virtual Band Car Radio Dog for providing us with our theme music.